Endoscopic ultrasound, EUS guided, hepaticogastrostomy is considered an advanced technique of interventional endoscopy for internal drainage of bile in patients with malignant jaundice and where endoscopic retrograde cholangiopancreatography, ERCP, is impossible. In a patient with jaundice after previous Whipple procedure, ultrasound reveals dilated intrahepatic bile ducts in both hepatic lobes and, in addition, multiple hepatic and peritoneal metastases. Biliodigestive anastomosis could not be reached with an enteroscope. An alternative percutaneous transhepatic cholangial drainage, PTCD, for external bile drainage was declined by the patient. The transgastric endoscopic ultrasonography of the left hepatic lobe shows the dilatated intrahepatic bile ducts with undisturbed communication. Using color Doppler mode, many pronounced vessels near the bile ducts can be detected. The fundamental issue for planning of the EUS-guided hepaticogastrostomy is at first searching for the best and safest site of an interventional approach to get access to the biliary system. The transgastric puncture of the left hepatic duct is performed with a 19-gauge needle. Using contrast media, control fluoroscopy confirms the dilated intrahepatic bile ducts and the absent bile drainage through the anastomosis into the jejunum. Under EUS guidance, a 0.035-inch guide wire is inserted through the needle into a bile duct. This maneuver can be observed real-time with fluoroscopy. The guide wire should be introduced as far as possible to achieve a stable position for the next steps. Over the guide wire, a high-frequency ring knife is pushed forward up to the gastric wall. Under changing EUS and fluoroscopy control, the motion of the ring knife during high-frequency cauterization is followed. Hereafter, approval of hepatic consistency is essential. The ring knife can be moved forward through the hepatic tissue faster or slower. Favoring the slow motion, cauterization should be repeated two or three times to avoid unfavorable dilatation of the former puncture channel prior to stent insertion. The stent delivery system, armed with a fully covered metal stent, is pushed over the guide wire to be watched closely with EUS and fluoroscopy. At the beginning of stent release, we see, under EUS guidance, the expanding distal end of the stent within the dilated bile duct. At this moment, it is essential to hold a close position to the gastric wall, in particular, if the releasing stent reaches the space between gastric wall and liver surface to prevent stent dislocation into the abdominal cavity. It is necessary to draw back the delivery system from time to time, watching the distal stent end is held at the correct position of the stent, in particular, the intrahepatic stent end already placed within the bile duct. The last part of stent delivery comprises gastroscopic control and checking the correct position of the stent using fluoroscopy. The favorable position of the intragastric or proximal end of the stent should be nearly 1.5 to 2 cm above the mucosa of the gastric wall within the gastric cavity. After complete stent delivery, the effusion of bile and pus demonstrates and provides evidence for the correct position of the stent. To prevent stent dislocation, the stent can be fixed with hemoclips at the intragastric mucosal site. Further control fluoroscopy shows the correct stent position and the effusion of contrast media into the stomach can be seen. On the first post-interventional day, stent position is controlled using transabdominal ultrasound. The intrahepatic bile ducts show normal caliber with aerobilia. The stent itself crossing segment 2 and stent opening are complete. The intervention was performed with peri-interventional prophylaxis using the antibiotic centriaxone. Worth mentioning is that re-intervention via the stent is possible but infrequently necessary since in patients with malignant jaundice there is a poor prognosis with limited life expectancy.